Welcome to the Holy Post. The feminist movement has made significant advances in the last 50 years, but data is indicating that men are falling behind. Fewer men than women are graduating from college, deaths of despair are highest among men, and the phrase toxic masculinity is ubiquitous in our culture. Today we discuss Christine Emba's new article seeking a positive vision for masculinity and why it's elusive to both the right and the left. Then Caitlin talks to Justin Gibney from the AND campaign about the upcoming 2024 election. How can Christians avoid the partisan polarization and culture war extremism? And he explains the wisdom of the historic black church with its commitment to both scripture and justice. Also this week, what is God trying to tell us through a surfing sea otter? This week, we also have some exclusive new content for Holy Post Plus subscribers. This time, Christian Taylor and I have a conversation about what it really means to keep the Sabbath. If it's primarily about not working, why did Jesus feed and heal and teach on the Sabbath? And what's the link between the Sabbath in the Old Testament and slavery? It's an eye-opening conversation, and it's just a tiny bit of the extra content that you'll get as part of Holy Post Plus, including bonus interviews with our guests, written content from Holy Post pundits, exclusive merchandise, the Holy Post book club, and monthly live streams with me and Phil. So go to holypost.com and learn more and sign up today. Here is episode 574. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hello, Phil. And Caitlin Chess. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> Hi, Phil. Hi. What was the highlight of your last week? Sky, go first. Uh, my son came back from a 10-day hiking trip up a mountain in British Columbia. Oh, wow. And Did we he? had zero contact with him, like no phones, no cell reception, nothing. Yeah. And so we didn't know how he was doing. He came back. He said it was the hardest thing he's ever done <clears throat> did, and the did best he, thing he's ever done. Did he leave so. a boy and come back a man? I think in a way he sort of did. Yeah. yeah. All right. He was with nine other, or there were nine high school seniors or college freshmen and then three guides that were with them. And yeah, it was, it was pretty was transformative. Was it a young life thing? It was a young life thing. Oh. He went to the Beyond Malibu trip, for those of you who are young lifers and know what I'm talking about. It's Malibu, British Columbia, not oh, California. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know there was one. Let's wow. go to Malibu yeah, and climb mountains. <laughs> the the <laughs> pictures were stunning and he, you know, glaciers and hiking up the ice and not falling in the crevasses and all that kind of oh, stuff wow. it was it was pretty uh i could not have done it i'll be honest with you okay based on the pictures or based yeah on the I, I mean these boys are all in like peak physical condition and he said it was really really hard so it was all right. but it was great great having him home okay. grateful for the young life folks that led them on that trip it was really impactful yeah. and and uh caitlin what did you do last week that was similar <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I did go on an adventure. Did you? Um, I drove like an hour or two around the area around me to go to as many thrift stores as I could go to. Oh, so there was wow. discovery. There was exhaustion. Did you fall there into was any crevasses? weird smells. <laughs> no, but could have. I mean, some people get pretty violent in these thrift store situations. Yeah. Like you might have to fight someone for like an amazing deal. So what were you looking for? What was your quest? I, I wasn't looking for anything. I just love going thrift shopping. <laughs> oh, okay. I was with a friend, and I was like, what you want is what I will find. I'm kind of considering making this my side gig, because I have none of those currently, and I should just do a lot of like going and finding good deals for people with what they specifically want, because I think I'm gifted at it. Did you come home with <laughs> nothing for you? Oh, no, Phil, of course I came home with things. Oh, for okay, me okay, too. okay. Please tell me it was something other than books. <laughs> yeah, not books. I did not buy any books. Okay, I did not what, buy any okay. books. What'd you buy? What'd you buy? Um, a lot of clothes. That's what it really? was. Really? A lot? It was clothes shopping. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, kind of a lot. It was kind of a lot. Okay. But it was like great deals, like amazing finds. So, great. It was amazing. an adventure. Are, are these things you then flip to make money, or is this just for your own? I should do that. Enjoyment. That would be a good idea. It is for okay. my own enjoyment. It's just so it's so satisfying to like be just like 
sifting through a pile of random things and 90% of it is not worth anything. And Mm -hmm. then you find a coat that fits you perfectly. It's not going to be cold enough here, but I bought two coats because they were perfect and they were like in good condition and Mm -hmm. beautiful. So I just have to move somewhere cold now, I guess. Hey, I can think of some place that you could move where you could wear your coats. Okay, we'll we'll talk about that later. But the, the first time you wear one of those items on the podcast, you have to point it out to us. Okay, I'll come in with a full coat one time. (laughs) It doesn't have to be the coat. Just say, I'm wearing a thrift store find. That'll be a good ad for my new business I'm going to (laughs) start. Yes, yes. Uh, Deals with Caitlin or Caitlin getting shopped for by Caitlin Chess. Okay. There we go. And now the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Today's episode of the Holy Post is sponsored by Magic Spoon. What's that? Let me explain. I got a box in the mail from a new company that wanted to sponsor the podcast. I opened it up and it was full of breakfast cereal. I like breakfast cereal, but the box said this cereal had zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. It's high protein, no sugar, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. And I thought, oh no, this is going to taste like packing peanuts. So I poured myself a small bowl of the peanut butter flavor and gave it a try. And the next thing I said was, Lisa, you got to come try this. And she said, wow, that's really good. But then our six-year-old granddaughter, Marley, came over, so we had her test it. She tried all four flavors that come in the variety pack, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. And then she wanted to eat more. She liked them so much, she asked if she could take the whole box back to her house. Seriously, Magic Spoon cereal, only 140 calories a serving, and it tastes really good. You got to check this out. So go to magicspoon.com slash Holy Post to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Holy Post at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash Holy Post and use the code Holy Post to save $5 off. And thank you to Magic Spoon for surprising me and and for sponsoring this episode. So, uh, animal news. We got some animal news. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You're okay with that, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're good with I think we're starting slow. We're good with animal oh. news. Um, mm-hmm. The animal kingdom seems to be rising up against humans. We had the story of, of Frida the walrus, who was sinking people's boats in Norway. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast, but there's the story of the pods of orcas that are attacking yachts yeah. off the coast of Spain and disabling their rudders very intelligently, and in some cases causing so much damage that the boats start taking on water and have to be towed back to shore. Now we've got a sea otter in Santa Cruz, California, that's stealing surfers' surfboards. It's actually, Is it surfing? Um, there are pictures of it on a surfboard on a small wave. Yeah, so surfing sea otter steals surfboards, eludes capture. A wild sea otter has apparently discovered a pirate passion for commandeering surfboards from surfers. So he, oh, did you find the pictures? It's so cute. Yeah, so Caitlin Caitlin found it. It's a female. She she has been climbing on to surfers' surfboards and being aggressive enough that the surfers feel they need to get off the surfboard. And uh, then she takes the surfboard away. So that's something. That's something new. Don't girl boss. Aren't surfboards usually tethered to like the surfer's ankle? Yeah, yeah. You you so would probably can't... pull the tether if you didn't want to be dragged out to sea by an angry I mean, female sea otter. In all these pictures, the person is very close to the surfboard. They're still there. I wonder how this started. Like, why did the, the otter want the surfboard? Because they, they're like she kind of dream. natural surfboards, aren't they? They just float around on their back and they... Yeah, maybe maybe she watched the movie Surf's Up about the surfing penguins. 
and said I could do that. My favorite picture, you should check out the pictures on this article. My favorite picture is one of just the, the otter on a surfboard sitting there in the waves and a harbor seal is poked its yeah. head. Uh, you see that one? Yeah. A harbor seal has poked its head out next to the surfboard and is just staring at it. Like, dude, <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> you crossed they the do line, like, dude. You crossed the line. This is yeah. They wonderful. do seem like unusually intelligent animals. They are super yeah. smart. Yeah. yeah, but but what do we what do we chalk this up to this this rising? Maybe it was here's a theory um, because of covid, all the humans disappeared for a couple of years and the animal kingdom felt mm -hmm. like, you know, hey, this place is ours again. And then when we came back, you know, they I resented it. How about that? I don't think covid interfered with people surfing. Not very though. much. No. Right, okay. outdoor stuff is what everyone did. Okay, well, what's your theory then, Sky Jatani? Why are the, I think why some animals are just crazy. Like we had a dog when I was growing up. Yeah, she was a little fox terrier, and she used to run around the neighborhood and break into people's homes and steal their brooms. She would steal brooms from garages, or she would go in and steal brooms from like you know those nice brass brooms people would have next to their fireplaces. Yeah, to like clean out. She would steal brooms, and then she would bite the bristles in her mouth and she'd run up and down the street with the stick like bouncing off the pavement and we had like dozens of brooms at our house because she would steal them from all the houses in the neighborhood that and really and weird. little she's this little dog and would just the other thing she did that was weird is she would whenever someone was in the bathroom she would wait with great anticipation at the door and then the moment the door opened she would bust into the bathroom and jump up on the toilet bowl just to watch the water go down the toilet bowl huh. She was totally, it was like a fetish did for her. That, she loved it. She was crazy. Some animals are just nuts. Did that and I disturb, think that's what's happening Did that here. disturb any dinner guests? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. It very much did. I can only imagine. And what did it do for the relations with your neighbors when you ended yeah, up Yeah, that was an issue All of the neighborhood's brooms were in your home. Yeah, she was like a, she was like a witch with her broom running up and down the, yeah. the street. Yeah, yeah, and that's how witches fly. People would they, stop, like cars would stop and watch this dog. But they that's irrational behavior. Yeah. Whereas this otter is like, I think she has a dream to be a surfer. Yeah, yeah, and the orcas. They she have do, a yeah, dream. she has a dream. They have a dream to be in a boat-free ocean. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the two theories about the orcas, one theory is that there was a this matriarchal mm -hmm. orca that was hit by a boat at some point, and now she has like this... Vendetta. Vengeance against boats, and they're teaching it to other orcas. The other theory is that they're just doing this for fun, that they're just yeah. they're just kind of mischievous SOBs, and they're going after boats for fun because they get a kick out But they've never done this it. before. Just like walruses do not show up in Norway to sun themselves on other people's boats. It's 900 miles from where walruses live. And there's a the woman taking the pictures of the surfboard stealing otter, says she's 60. She's lived there her entire life. She's never seen anything like this before. Stuff's happening, Sky. It's an uprising. It's an animal uprising. Are it's all like, of these animals female? Oh, I think they are. I don't know. Maybe there's a little feminism happening mm. among the animals. Oh. And they're trying to bring down the patriarchy, Caitlin. Is that it? One surfboard at a time. Yeah. Well, that's mm. fat. What do you think is going to be next? What's What's the next <laughs> shoe to fall? Oh. In the animal. Well, these kingdom? are all these are all aquatic animals. Yeah. So is that that's where true. it stays? No, I it's got to move. I don't know. I've you've seen pictures of like a moose. Someone finds a moose in their swimming pool, just kind of cooling off. I don't yeah, know if that's the same. Mm. No. <laughs> moose mooses taking over swimming pools. No. If it was a public pool, it'd be more fun. Okay. I don't really have a theological angle on this. I was thinking about something, you know, if people don't praise God, the rocks will cry out. And so what are we not doing that would make the animal kingdom rise up like this? What are we failing to do? Like, like devote our surfboards to God and our yachts to God. And since we're not doing that. We're just not surfing well enough. The otters not, are doing it for yeah, us. Yes, we're not su surfing to the glory of God. So the otters yeah, will rise yeah, up. Probably and, true. Yeah. See? Caitlin agrees with me, Sky. Do you agree with me? I like that. What, what it would be amazing is if, like the orcas, if this otter ends up teaching other otters and more of them start that, emulating this behavior. It looked like behavior. he was, or she yeah. was teaching. Yeah. Because yeah. then you could have this whole surfers versus otters. It's a great, like, Hollywood script. It is. Surfers mm -hmm. versus otters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my grandkids' main knowledge of otters is from the 
climax of Finding Dory when the otters help out by stopping traffic by being cute. They all line up in the middle of the highway and be cute. And this is a little different because they actually had to put up warning signs that say aggressive otter. See, maybe this lady otter was like, no, I don't like the media representation I'm yeah. receiving. Yeah. I'm going to show y'all by who being you calling, a great who surfer. Who you calling cute? Yeah. Try to get your surfboard back. You <laughs> think I'm cute. Yeah, I'm going to put the surfboard in your teeth. And Just then this thought. dog's going to whack you with a broomstick. Yeah. After the orca knocks the rudder off your boat. <laughs> okay. God, what are you trying to tell us? <laughs> What is the message from this? It seems like if we were prophets, you know, if we were Old Testament prophets, we could, there's a good angle here about Israel. Good thing we're not. Are you sure? I don't know. I think some things, not everything has a meaning. I know, but that the fun is is finding one anyway. That's (laughs) that's what it means to be human, to find meaning where there is Uh none. Those stars, okay. son, those stars are the two twins, and they control my life. I'm a Gemini. See? Okay. <laughs> okay. This has been the end <laughs> of uh, Animal News for this week. What we really need to talk about, speaking of animals, is men. <laughs> Back to the patriarchy. (laughs) Men, men, men. Big article, huge article, essay, essay, came out in the Washington Post from Christine Emba. Christine Emba is best known for her book, Rethinking Sex, trying to rethink the uh, sexual dynamics of the modern era that beyond simply consent into what's a meaningful sexual ethic. And uh, she's back with a, a long essay about the state of men. Yeah, uh, before you go into that, Caitlin, you interviewed her about that book, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. we should, yeah, in the show podcast. notes, we should have a link to That's that right. interview. And, and it looks like we're going to get to interview her about this article as well. Yes. I believe it's being set up right now. So in a few it weeks, is. we'll be back to talk to Miss or Mrs. Emba. She married, Ms. do we know? Miss Emba. Anyway, she'll mm-hmm. be back. So why, why is she talking? Why is Christine talking about men? Um, something weird is going on with men. I could see a bit of curdling in some of the men around me. They struggled to relate to women. They didn't have enough friends. They lacked long-term goals. Some guys, including ones I once knew, just quietly disappeared, subsumed into video games and porn, or sucked into the alt-right and the web of misogynistic communities known as the manosphere. Young men everywhere were trying on new identities, many of them ugly, all gesturing toward a desire to belong. And asking the question, as as many young men are, what the heck does good masculinity look like anymore? Uh, She says, in the past 50 years, there's been a, uh, has been, sorry, let me do that again. The past 50 years have been revolutionary for women, but there hasn't been a corresponding conversation about what role men should play in a changing world. So enter personalities, influencers like Jordan Peterson, the Canadian psychology professor turned anti-woke juggernaut. Uh, If there's a vacuum in modeling manhood today, Peterson has been one of the boldest in stepping up to fill it. And then less, even less good, Andrew Tate, a caricature of masculinity, constantly shouting about his sports cars and his women, multiples of each, naturally, a cigar surgically attached to his hand. If young men are looking for direction, these influencers give them a clear script to follow. Hours of video, thousands of book pages, a torrent of social media posts in a moment with when uncertainty abounds. The rules aren't particularly unique. Get fit. Pick up a skill. Talk to women instead of watching porn all day. But if instruction is lacking elsewhere, even basic tips, one of Peterson's famous pieces of advice is clean your room. <laughs> these basic tips feel like a revelation in a world with a lack of Uh, of instructions for being a man. At their best, these male influencers highlight positive traits that were traditionally associated with maleness, protectiveness, leadership, emotional stability, and encourage them, making masculinity out to be a real and necessary thing. Uh, But 
On the downside, many of the visions of masculinity these figures are pushing are wildly antisocial, untethered to any idea of good. Men are urged to situate themselves in a mythic story in which the world was always meant to be under their control. The fact that it is no longer is, uh, becomes fuel for defensiveness and a victim complex. So, okay, Embra is convinced, she says, I'm convinced that men are in crisis. And I strongly suspect that ending it will require a positive vision of what masculinity entails that is particular. And that's uh, one of the topics of conversation is kind of how the progressive end has has uh, worked to declare there, you know, there are no gender distinctives. We're all exactly the same. Everyone is interchangeable. So there is nothing particular, uh, nothing unique about men or about women and men should try to be just more like women and women should be able to do whatever they want so that's kind of where it starts it's a long long piece and she interviews a whole bunch of people um but first of all hey caitlin chess you're a woman you're growing up in a world of men of a the young age. So many of the men that she's talking about are kind of, you know, millennials in your uh -huh. in your cohort. These men are in your cohort, Caitlin. <laughs> are you asking me if the men my age suck? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of what I'm asking is from, okay, go back to high school. Think about your male friends in high uh -huh, school and uh -huh. then on through to Duke, you know, through Liberty and, and Dallas and now Duke. What what are you observing about men of a certain age? Uh oh. I I will say I was so thankful to read this article because I think her description of the lack of options was a really good way of describing what I have seen, which is on one hand I've known a lot of men from like like you said high school through college through seminary who heard that the options available were either there's no like idea of what masculinity is. Anything that you determine as masculine must just be bad. There's no positive vision. Or they just thought that like completely untethered, unrestrained aggression, physical strength, et cetera, that must be masculinity. Like not adhering to, and this is a long dynamic. Like this has been true for most of human history that we've had this stereotype that women are the civilizing force. And so in response to that, the idea was like, no, masculinity must just be unrestrained by social mores, not accountable to anything. Like you described Andrew Tate, cars and women and whatever. And I, I have experienced what she describes in terms of both, especially in the church. Like there are not a lot of men, a lot of men my age in the church. There are a lot of young women and a lot of single young women because they're really struggling to find young men who are committed to the Christian faith in the churches that they're in. And I don't think that's a result of the church being feminized. I think that's the result of both of the available options of masculinity aren't really the Christian version of masculinity. Like there's not, um, you're, I hope in many churches you won't find this like overly aggressive, domineering kind of masculinity. The best, most faithful churches will not be giving you that. And they also won't be giving this other option. But if those are the options that feel accessible to men and they're not finding them in the church, then that's not where they're going to go. I don't think that's the fault of the church, but it is the experience mm -hmm. of most of the young women that I know. Okay. Okay. So you do see some of this happening ar yeah. around you? Um, Sky, what's your vantage point on men these days? Because you mostly just hang out with me, so you know. I mean, how's Phil doing? How manly am I? For heaven's sake, Phil is quite manly, despite his attempts to present otherwise. With it, with a ukulele um, in one hand and a puppet on the other. Yeah, okay. Sounds well, right. you're redefining. It's more of the Fred Rogers definition of masculinity, but that's fine. Yeah, uh -huh. um, that's great. Yeah, it is. I my. I, <laughs> this is such a hard conversation to have because it feels like it is, and, and she admits this even in the article like there's so many landmines that you could step on here that's going to ups, upset people on all sides one of the factors here and I'm not oh, I'm not exactly sure how to say this because I didn't put a ton of time or thought into this before we started recording good 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 yeah I know that's great I I, one of the angles I don't think she explored a lot in the article that I would be interested in looking at is how the sexual revolution from the 60s onward has negatively impacted men. 
you know, we often talk about how it's impacted women with the advent of birth control and, and sexual liberation and, and um, the liber- liberalizing of divorce laws and things like that. But we haven't really talked about the impact it's had on men. And here's the thing, like biologically, women have a an incentive to mature, meaning when when they are pregnant or they have a child, they are forced to mature because they are physically responsible for caring for another human being. Men don't have that. And so what historically has forced men into maturity, into responsibility, was marriage and having a family. In other words, Mm -hmm. if they wanted their sexual impulses satisfied, that was confined to marriage. And so they would have to find themselves in a situation where they were caring for a family, Mm -hmm. for a spouse, and in most cases, economically, they were the breadwinner. And so those sexual desires forced them into maturity because of the social systems that were there. Well, the sexual revolution comes along and it's told men, you don't have to be married anymore to fulfill your sexual desires, which means you don't have to be responsible for another person. You don't have to be responsible for the children that may be produced from your sexual activity. Activity, And then you compound all that with our consumer culture and the pornography and everything else that is you know, saturating the environment, and you have all these men that can have their sexual fulfillment without the need for responsibility or maturity, and you build that into the system over decades, and you end up with what she talks about toward the end of her article, which is the significant number of boys who are growing up without any father figures in our society, and that that leads to a lack of role models in their lives for what does a healthy masculinity look like. And then the cycle just repeats itself. So, I I mean, I don't think a lot of people are comfortable addressing that in our society, that maybe the sexual revolution has done more harm to men than we often think, because we usually think of it as liberating for women. Um, And in many ways it was, but I I think there's a side effect here that we're not looking at closely enough. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, She refers to a book written 20 years ago by anthropologist David Gilmore called Manhood in the Making, Cultural Concepts of Masculinity, which is a cross-cultural study of manliness around the world. Gilmore found that almost all societies have a concept of, quote, real, true, or adult manhood that was seen as a valuable and indispensable ideal. But it was something that had to be earned. Men achieved it by providing for their families and broader society, by protecting their tribe and others, and by successfully procreating. In the modern moment, however, all three of these goals seem less celebrated and further from reach. Young men who disappear into online forums, video games, or pornography see none of the social or personal rewards of meeting these goals, and their loneliness and despair suggest how painful it has been to lose track of this ideal. So one thing in here that's, that's I think, touchy and hard for people to even talk about is, are there things that men need to be okay, you know, to feel good about themselves that are distinct from things that women need to be okay or feel good about themselves. And that, because that gets into gender roles and gender stereotypes and cultural issues, we're really uncomfortable with even, you know, asking Mm -hmm. that question in many cases. And uh, she interviews a strategist, a democratic strategist who says, my party won't even talk about whether there are specific needs that men have that need to be addressed specific to men as opposed to you know, we've kind of stopped talking about men and women and we just talk about people on the left and on the right there's very much talk about men and women and trying to figure out how to recapture and or hold on to the distinction which is partly i think why transgender issues and lgbt issues are so uh, uh so prominent on the right because it's you know it's challenging this central kind of platform of society that we are distinct men and women. Caitlin, you had something to say. I do. I, I could tell. <laughs> well, I think on one hand, I, I think what you've just described is totally true. I also think, though, part of what she's describing is that both men and women as humans need intimate connection and need, and I truly, like, I think we've lost this sense in our modern sense of, like, what it means to be free we need other people to be dependent on us and we need to depend on other people and in my experience especially among people my age 
it is just true that women are more aware of that need and create communities and relationships in which they have that. I'm thinking about the women at my church who many are single and even the ones who are married, many do not have children or it's later in their life they have children. They are deeply involved in the church. They have really deep in-person relationships they've cultivated. Whereas as she's described, a lot of what's going on is that men are retreating into the internet in ways that women have not done as much. And I think part of that is a difference between men and women in terms of relational intelligence and like capability. But I also think it's just, we all do need this thing. And it relates to what Sky was saying about the sexual revolution. I think that's really important. In Christine Emba's book that we talked about earlier, she talks about the cost of the sexual revolution on women, which was a reframing. We've thought of it, as you've described, as like liberating for women. And she, as you described, says, it's women that bear the consequences of supposedly obligation-free sex that doesn't stay that way for women, both in terms of pregnancy, but also for women in terms of a much shorter amount of their life in which they can have children than men. Right. And so they have a have a reason to try and get a stable relationship in a way men do not. The thing that I don't think is in that book that would really benefit from what you just described is that actually it is important for all human beings to have those kind of intimate dependent relationships so even if women are the ones that bear the cost of it they also get the joy of it it's a real good thing for them to have really deep relationships whether that's children or not but that's often what it is whereas men having the quote-unquote freedom to avoid that is actually really bad for men too and i i think this all relates to to the point that she never really gets to which i understand why of kind of articulating what is the healthy vision of masculinity? Mm -hmm. But I think part of it should be some description of what it looks like to have other people depend on you and depend on the things that it's not true of all men, um, but is you know true of more men than women that there's physical strength. And, and it is true that in our cultural context, a lot of power in certain spheres. She talks about the fact that even though women are getting more college education, are succeeding over men in certain metrics, it still is true that men have most of the authority in government and in business. And so what would it look like for those to not be the unrestrained expression of physical strength or dominance that the Andrew Tates and the Jordan Petersons might want? But a restrained vision of that that's like oriented towards serving people, oriented towards protecting people. Like I was recently, I was not thrift shopping, but regular shopping. And there was this group of like five or six teenage boys that were in the dressing room of this store I was at being ridiculous. Like they clearly had all gone and picked out outfits for each other that they were supposed to try on. A lot of it was women's clothes. They were clearly like being silly and whatever. But it really it was the first time it had occurred to me because I did not have brothers and I grew up, I had teenage girl experience. I didn't have a lot of teenage boy experience. And I was watching them and realizing like, you are right at the age where you have recently probably gained the physical dominance to freak out the very small women employees of this dressing room. They were clearly a little unsettled by the rowdiness of it. And you probably aren't even aware yet that you, I mean, they're all tall, pretty big. I think they were all on some kind of sports team together. I don't even think you're aware of the intimidation that you can have. And again, as you've described, if you don't have male figures that can help you see that and can help you express that in appropriate context, but then also, I just kept looking at them and thinking, even if just one of you was ex ex like expressing restraint, was saying yeah. like, no, we're yeah. going to quiet down. I'm going to encourage y'all to not freak out these young employees. I'm going to encourage us to have fun, but not in a way that frightens people or could damage this merchandise or could do anything destructive. That would have not just been cool because it was restraint. It would have been really beautiful to me because there was power, but it was restraint. It wouldn't have been the same as like a woman being like, hey, I'm not going to be loud and physically domineering because I can't be. It would be different to say like, you could be, you chose not to, you saw that these women were uncomfortable and you did something like that to me in that moment was like, that's really, that would be beautiful masculinity. And they're young and they have, I'm not, I don't want to like make it sound like these boys were doing anything horrible, but I just thought that that's part of what's being described by some of this is like directionless strength that doesn't yeah. have anything speaking into it to say, how are you using that yeah. well? And to be fair, that's always been a part of adolescent sure. boyhood. But the difference is society has changed. Like the idea was for boys, men, young men, whatever, to fulfill their selfish desires. Society said you needed to serve others. In order to fulfill your sexual desire, you needed to be married and 
commit yourself to a woman and to a family. In order to fulfill your achievement desires, you needed to commit yourself to an organization or an institution like the military or a corporation or something that you served. And now, overwhelmingly, what the culture is saying to young men is you can fulfill all those selfish desires mm -hmm. without responsibility, without committing to an institution. You can be an influencer. You can go be an entrepreneur. You can you know, have all the sexual exploits you want without commitment. You can do all of this now without those responsibilities that would normally restrain your impulses. And what she does mention in the article, and Phil, you quoted this part, that when, whatever culture you look at, masculinity is defined as being responsible and protective of others. And that's what our society has lost. It's now saying you can fulfill all those selfish impulses yeah. without being protective of others and without being responsible for others. And almost every problem in society is a result of unrestrained young men. And that's where we are. And no one has a really convincing answer for that except the extreme right, which gives an even more toxic version yeah. of it that is not helpful, I think. Yeah, I'm also... <clears throat> I'm intrigued by how Christianity is, is getting sucked into this conversation, particularly from the right. Um, Tucker Carlson recently interviewed Andrew Tate, you know, to kind of give him a chance to defend himself and his vision of masculinity. Tucker Carlson is also going viral right now for a two or three minute clip where he talks about the Bible and how he's how he makes mistakes when he's reading the Bible and but he's trying to do better. Um, Charlie Kirk, who just recently said black women like Michelle Obama don't have, quote, the brain processing power to keep up with white people. And that's why they needed affirmative action. Also started a conference for pastors. Uh, Jordan Peterson is trying to help guys grow up and clean their rooms and is now also teaching the book of Exodus on the Daily Wire website. Uh, Mark Driscoll screamed at guys to grow up, settle down, get married and have kids and abused the people that were following him at the same time. Uh, of course, John MacArthur tells uh, Beth Moore to go home. So there's a whole, and then we have the, the whole dynamic of the Theo bros, you know, the, these bearded, young men on social media that want to argue about everything and that was or kind of real a life <laughs> yeah yeah and that was kind of a culture that mark driscoll helped to develop because he encouraged the guys in his community to argue about theology to get together and argue about theology that it was a sign this is what masculinity is in a christian context it's being aggressive and combative over theology and if you spend much time on Christian Twitter, there's a whole <laughs> lot of aggression and combativeness over theology, which, you know, I mean, I guess St. Nicholas attacked that one guy for his theology. He didn't. He punched him. He punched he him. He probably did not. He punched no. him. Oh, you weren't there, Caitlin. <laughs> you weren't there. Santa Claus beat the crap out of a dude because nope. he was bad theology but Caitlin says that's not true so I'm I'm very curious how people in the church are either adopting the Bible as part of their framework of masculinity or using masculinity to try to attract men to the Bible you know the Mark Driscoll way versus the Charlie Kirk and the Tucker Carlson way and what does it say about what does it say about anything? <laughs> what does it say about our cultural moment that, that we're tr trying to... Are we using the Bible to try to get the culture back to where we think it should be? Or are we using masculinity to get people to the Bible? Or both? I, I think there's a lot of projection going on here. <laughs> Me? A ton of projection. Me? You think I'm Not you. <laughs> No, 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 no. On, on their part, you, oh. you, using the Bible as a way of just projecting their own values yes. on the, and, and getting using the Bible as a, uh, a validator of their own views. But he, here's the thing. Like, I'm, I don't want to dismiss the value of talking about femininity or masculinity. There's a place for that. We also need to understand that a lot of those do come from cultural yep. assumptions rather than anything biological or intrinsic. Not entirely, but some. But here's the point. If you are a... Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, whether a man or a woman, you need to start with Jesus himself. He is our example of goodness and justice and rightness and maturity. And what we see in him 
as a man should be my model of masculinity and what we see in him as a woman should be your model of femininity it's sky. it is sky it transcends gender just, and that's sky. where we bypass that and go no, no no i want to look at david as a warrior i want to look at samson with his beard or i want to look at and you don't want to look at jesus because those he exhibits values that don't fit american masculinity the way we want it to and that's how you get those crazy posters of him with you know m16s and and eagles and ripping you, muscles and did, craziness like that did you say we're supposed to look at jesus as a woman is that what you just said he's a model of, of christian identity period whether you uh -huh. are a man or a woman okay 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 because that's a question of mine and fortunately i have two leading theologians on the call right now to answer this question as a christian i'm supposed to conform myself to the model of jesus Mm -hmm. I assume that means for girls, too, <laughs> because, and I think I joked at one point on Twitter, maybe, that we believe guys are supposed to grow up to be like Jesus and girls are supposed to grow up to be like Elizabeth Elliot. The Proverbs you know? 31 woman. Yeah, yeah, which, you know, that's, that was one, that was one accomplished lady yeah, there. Yeah, oh yeah, Proverbs. businesswoman. Yeah, she was a CEO of her enterprise. Anywho, anywho. How do you find uh, specific calling characteristics for men and women if we're both simply supposed to become like Jesus? Because not everything Jesus does is intrinsically linked to his masculinity. Right. Okay. A lot of what he does has nothing to do with his identity as a man. It has everything to do with his identity as a human being who fully represents the character of God. Yeah. So yeah, okay. when you see but you're not being patient or kind or merciful or whatever, that's not linked to masculinity or femininity. Okay, but you're a young you're a young man. You're growing up in our culture with a lot of confusion. You don't have good older ra male <laughs> rail mole models, ra male role models, and so you you look to Jesus. Okay, I want to be like Jesus. What where do you find a specific view of masculinity in Jesus that wouldn't apply equally to women. Are there things about Jesus where you would say to a woman, that's not for you? I, I don't know that I would say that that strongly, but I do think if you're looking for something in Jesus that is distinctly masculine, yeah. it is specific to his cultural context, which is why we both need, I mean, Paul even talks about this, right? Like imitate me as I imitate Christ. You need to look at Jesus. You also need real life like people that are physically embodied with you currently and are in the cultural context you are in to help you and having okay. that and and that it's important that not everyone you follow needs to be the same gender as you but having someone who is is important i will say though in the gospels we do have some descriptions of jesus that in his cultural context would have applied pretty exclusively not entirely but pretty exclusively to him and that is concern for the well-being and sacrifice for the well-being of vulnerable people, very often women. Like if there's anything distinctly masculine about what Jesus does in the Gospels, it's how over and over and over again, he protects women, he elevates women, he speaks for the dignity and value of women. And there are things that he does in the Gospels that in his cultural context, maybe not in ours, but in his cultural context, were not things women could have done. When he protects right. a woman who's going to be stoned for adultery, a, a law that was intended to apply to both the man and the woman and was not being applied that way in that time, he could do something both physically and because of the authority he had as a man that a woman in his place could not have done. A woman could not have stood in front of the elders of the law and said, you who is without sin throw the first stone. That would have been impossible. What that I think means for our context is both a lesson specifically for men of you want to be like Jesus, and one of the things he does that I think is distinctly masculine and is still true in our context is you use the resources available to you, the physical power, the privilege, on behalf of the most vulnerable. That includes women. It also includes children, uh, foreigners, like orphans, like those kinds of vulnerable people you sacrifice for. What that means for women in our context today is there might be situations where you still don't have the opportunity to do that. But praise God for many of the good changes that have happened. You also get to imitate Jesus in a way that would That's have right. been distinctly masculine in the past and isn't so distinctly now in that you have, I mean, many women at least have a relative amount of privilege and power to do things on behalf of those who can't do it for themselves, to elevate them, to empower them, to protect them. And that's something that like, both should be a lesson in terms of we do that because Jesus did that and also should be a lesson in 
that's that you know transcends gender and also tells us that in specific cultural contexts asking the question of what is masculine and feminine and what is required of men and women is a relevant question like that was a relevant question to discern what jesus did and what people should today do now the problem is like many other things we talk about the bible does not give us a list of rules that say here's what it means to be a man here's what it means to be a woman it requires that we submit ourselves to the authority of scripture and then ask relevant questions about in our context here and now what are the gifts what are the obligations what are the responsibilities for men and women and they might still be distinct they just don't come to us in the form of here's a simple answer guidebook in the bible Oh, that's good, Caitlin. That's that's really good. Can you say that again? Because that was really good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's my recording. Yeah. I I hope we recorded that because that was uh, (laughs) that was really good. Here's my thought. Because this is this is sorry. My I have to tell you all. My my watch just asked if I was working out because that's how heated I was getting. Wow. Wow. Got your pulse going, huh? (laughs) When your theology really gets going. Yeah. It you burn you burn theological calories. (laughs) Um, and my thought is, well, okay, testosterone leads to, m- makes you more aggressive. That's just, that's just science. Give someone more testosterone, they become more aggressive. When you engage the world aggressively, you want to conquer. You know, there is, and for much of human history, exploring the world has been about conquering, conquering the unknown, conquering the enemy, conquering the indigenous people that don't want you to take their land, uh, conquering new industries, conquering each other. So it was a very male-oriented posture towards the world. We've mostly conquered stuff. And after particularly the, the 20th century, conquering kind of got a you know, we kind of decided it's not such a great thing to do anymore it's just it, the cost is too high this attempts at conquering and the world since then has gone into much more civilization has gone more into a nurturing posture whether where we're nurturing the european countries that we've got not conquering the european countries where we're not trying to remake the world in our own image anymore because we we're seeing what it's done to the natural world we're seeing seeing what it's done uh to the animal kingdom and we're seeing what it's doing to our own health so that our posture towards society and towards the earth has become more nurturing um, and and uh, cultivating, which for some guys does not come naturally, and so they're looking for other things to conquer. And that's where you get why are so many guys playing video games? Because in video games you can still conquer, you can still you can still wipe people out, you can still kill people. Why are so many guys drawn to porn? Because porn tends to view sexuality as a conquering, not as a nurturing, not as a cultivating, not as an equal exchange of affection, but as a male conquering. Um, And so men, rather than finding a new way to be men in a kind of post-conquering society, are looking for ways to, to maintain, you know, the aggression and it's in sports, it's in porn, it's in video games. Um, the tech industry is interesting because it's known as being hyper aggressive and hyper masculine. Because in the tech industry, there's still a sense that we're conquering new ideas. We are, we're breaking new ground. It's like space exploration. We're going places with technology that no one has ever gone before. And it's risky. And there's been a lot of talk about the lack of women in tech and the toxic masculinity in tech. Why just last week we had Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg uh, uh, challenging <laughs> each other to mixed martial arts fighting, and then Mark, then Elon Musk said, <laughs> maybe we should just compare the size of our genitalia. That's an actual thing. He did. Yes, that yes, yes. he actually did. Oh so I mean, imagine in a mature industry, you know, say Coca Cola and Pepsi, the CEOs of those two companies saying, "Let's compare the size of our genitalia to see whose company is cooler." That's how different tech is from everything else. It is it is still a world of of conquering men, you know, seeing who's the biggest dude on the block. But, Phil, what you're describing there is not unique to this moment. I mean, it is. W- it's totally well, unique. What other when, moment when you, have tech executives compared their genitalia in size? Huh? Oh. My, my point is, your, your, your argument's correct. Like, testosterone makes men aggressive. Yeah. And it has always been 
the case that men can take that aggression into really destructive places and it, it, whether it's criminal or warfare or killing each other and so civilizations have had to figure out how do we how do we steer this aggression into less destructive forms mm -hmm. and that's where you get the gladiatorial games it's where you get modern sports from it's where you get um, fraternities and and male athletic competitions and all. it's a way of filtering and focusing that energy into something that's not going to destroy the the people and it's also true that's where marriage comes from the sexual impulse of men could be incredibly destructive to the community so they define marriage as the exclusive you know sexual relationship between one man and a woman so yeah. that it doesn't go beyond those boundaries and create all kinds of chaos and problems but what a lot of contemporary consumer society has done is it has hyper individualized those pursuits and it has broken down those institutions that says to men now your sexual impulses don't have to be restrained within marriage and your aggression doesn't have to be kept just within the bounds of capitalism and and sports and things that can go wild and that's what you're hearing from the extreme right on this stuff is men should just be able to allow their aggressive natures to fly free everywhere and women should just get out of our way and that's mm -hmm. that's undoing thousands of years of human civilization that have, has taught men to restrain that impulse and th that's where we're at is as more and more of those restraints are falling away you're seeing this ridiculous behavior like Elon Musk and Josh Hawley from the Senate and and some of the stuff that Tate yeah. and these other morons yeah. are, are well, advocating okay. for. Well, okay, in 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 the Bible, can I go back to the Bible? Sky, is that allowed on this podcast? In the Old mm -hmm. Testament, Please. the story of David and Bathsheba says starts out. It was spring, I believe, the time when kings went to war. So going to war was a seasonal thing. It wasn't, oh, no, we haven't had a war in 30 years. We might be right. headed for another war. It was, oh, it's springtime. Come on, army. Come on, guys. Let's go to war. Because everything was in so much flux and borders and, you know, keep trying to maintain an empire, trying to build and conquer. So it was just a part of the natural. It was like, you know, plant, harvest, go to war was just part and that's where male desire to conquer was channeled was in the seasonal going to war which in if you look at how modern germany was formed they had the same view the prussians had the same view that we are so good at warfare we can do this you know every couple of years manage it really well you know play with the austrians play with the the french play with everybody and grab some land and it wasn't until you know, really World War One and World War Two that it broke that notion that you that war is part of being a man and building, you know, building the world. Okay. Sky. I mean, there's a flip side of this. There's a flip side of this. There is the conquering side of it. Yeah. The best possible spin on war is war as defense of protecting this your was family, the season your community. When your kings went to war. I understand, but my point is we need to take that impulse, that conquering impulse that you've identified, and society needs to guide men to use that impulse towards good. There yeah. are real problems in the world that we could focus that energy on solving. Yeah, We could fix a lot of broken things in the world if men, instead of going to conquer on the football field or the pitch or the battlefield, were focusing those energies on well, let's fix our cities. I let's know, overcome I know, but, poverty. But fixing let's solve things, this problem or that problem. Fixing things isn't nearly as fun as breaking things, which is why teenage boys want to go into the the women's the, go into the dressing rooms and try on women's clothes because it's like you're turning things upside down. It's like I want to trash the rest, the store, or the restaurant, or the house, or the school. You Fine, know, I that's blow a stuff phase up. that teenage boys may go through, but society is supposed to nurture them past that and give yes. them a model of no real strength, as, as Caitlin was saying. It comes from restraint. It is not using all that aggression in destructive right. ways, but focusing it in constructive ways that brings flourishing to right. others. Right, so, so Theodore Roosevelt, how did he become a man? Because he was a sickly little boy. And then he grew up, and how did he become a man? He went out west, and he conquered new territory. And then he joined the Mexican-American War, and he killed some people and led men in battle. And then <laughs> he went big game hunting in Africa, and he bagged a lion, and he bagged an elephant, and he bagged... It's okay. None of those things, all of those things were considered acceptable at the time. And that's just, that's just in the 20th century. So now we, it's, it's, 
go to Africa and study the elephants. Don't bag the elephants. You need to be Jane Goodall, not Teddy Roosevelt. You don't just go gallivanting into Mexico to have a war to see if you're a real man. You don't do that. That's the Wagner group in Ukraine. That's not acceptable. So like all these things that men were doing as recently as 100 years ago, we don't do anymore. And I'm saying what has filled the gap? What has filled the void? Because if it's, you know, learn to cook. It's apparently puppets and ukuleles. Well, I don't, I wasn't really driven to bag an elephant <laughs> or, or go fight Mexicans in the Mexican-American war. That was never my drive. I don't really have that problem, Sky. I don't know if you noticed that. Caitlin, you need to get in here. I'm losing yeah, my I, mind over here. I, yeah, okay. Caitlin. I, I just want to talk about the Bible really quick again. Thank you, Phil, for opening that up. Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I wanted just, to do a segue because I know that you're often afraid <laughs> to bring up the Bible on the podcast. <laughs> um, I just think it's really important that we have a vision at the very beginning of Genesis of good creational both desire and like created intent and commission by God to rule and reign. Like the language that's used in Genesis is one of authority and taking the good things God has given and doing something creative with them. It's telling that the language that's used in the Hebrew at the beginning of Genesis to describe that has this sense of authority, but in a very positive sense. And one of the first thing that happens after the fall is when it, when the, the curse of the ground and this description of what will happen to Adam and Eve is given, the thing that's said to Eve is your desire will be for your husband, which is so hard to figure out what that means. But then after that, it says, and he will rule over you. And the word in Hebrew, it might be translated rule in both senses. The word in Hebrew is different across that across those three chapters. It moves from this good picture of be creative, like be, um, you know, aggressive in that sense of like you have enthusiasm and energy and authority to create good things that moves from that kind of rule to domination to there have to be people under you. You have to subsume them to your will. And I think that's a good kind of metric for thinking about, OK, we're going wrong if either we say, to be masculine is this kind of second kind of rule, this domination of other people, especially women. That's a consequence of the fall. That's not something God has given us. However, if our alternative is to say, no, you just, you, you have to kind of be without a lot of enthusiasm or drive or desire to do things, just kind of sit at home, get on, you know, video games or pornography or whatever. And those things like video games, not pornography, but video games can be fine. But is that where you're putting all of your creative energy? That's really actually a denial of that first use of rule in the beginning of Genesis. Right. You're not using your body well. You're not actually being you know, creative in the world on behalf of the flourishing of other people. But that's a good metric to go like, if we're either ignoring that first sense of rule or we're falling into the second sense and saying that's the good sense of rule, neither of those are good for men or women. But it is telling that that's often used to describe the way that men go wrong. The next few chapters of Genesis are just tons of examples of primarily men asserting dominance over women, either by killing men or then, you know, sexually assaulting women. Like there's all of these pictures of how rule goes wrong. But the Christian response to all of this is not just to say, here's all the way rule goes wrong. It's to say, actually, we have this picture in the beginning of rule going right. I'm glad you bring up the cultural mandate from Genesis, because you, to Phil's point about nurture versus conquer, you you kind of see that there, too, because yeah. the man and woman are given the responsibility to care for the garden, yeah. which feels more like that upkeep and nurture. But they're also commanded to fill the earth and well, they're take, just to and, take the and order, beauty, it. and abundance of the garden and spread it throughout the world. There right. is this positive conquering yeah. or positive authority that you talk about, Caitlin, not this domineering thing. And you could argue that's a masculine and a feminine kind of yin and yang going on there. What I don't know, but they're both there. And I just think we need to take that, go and fill the earth and subdue it and instruct men, especially young men, and what does that look yeah. like in a form that brings flourishing and goodness rather than just destruction and chaos. Right. And that's what we've been failing to do. I hear you. Okay, that's awesome. I'm not advocating for an annual war to help shape <laughs> our, our boys into men. Thank just, you for clarifying just that. Just to make that mm -hmm. clear, I'm just saying there were patterns in history um, that made it very clear, oh, if you're a man, you're on this track and you're going to go do these manly things and you're going to bag an elephant and take over a country and then become the president. 
uh, which is what Teddy Roosevelt did, although not in that order. Um, so I'm really saying is the alternative just to tell young boys there is nothing particular about being male and just be kind and nurturing. Um, you know, and, I, and what I like about Christine Emba is she's saying, no, there has to be something particular because there is something particular. And we can see it in the fact that they are drawn to all these right wing figures who are giving them particulars, but they're giving them unhealthy particulars. So I right. love the idea that we can go back to Genesis one. We can go back to, you know, pre fall and find particulars that are healthy um, and can be seen as masculine. So maybe we need to write a book about that sky, huh? Yeah, well, and it's 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 also worth remembering that the fruit of the spirit is never gendered. It's universal, and so when you look at what marks the life of somebody who's living in communion with God and His Spirit, whether male or female, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness—all those things. And so, I want to have that conversation yeah. with a young man or young woman first, way before getting into well, what does masculinity mean? Or what does femininity mean? And that's, we're kind of bypassing that foundation of our faith and going straight to this gender conversation. Okay, but it, but and it I'm means, not sure that's helping. But it means other people are having that conversation other than you. Yes, I'm not saying we don't have it, but we need to start with okay. the universal well, in Christ rather you, than the particular in gender. Then you better get started. Mm -hmm. You better get started, Sky, because there's a whole lot of people waiting in line to meet Andrew Tate. Uh, but I think that's gonna have it's gonna have to be specific people. Like I think the failure of both these examples that Christina was talking about, and I think there are actually some pretty good parallel um, female examples. Like it was a it was it's kind of dated now, but a few years ago, big deal book, Girl Wash Your Face by Rachel mm -hmm. Hollis, very similar in some ways in that it was kind of stereotypically feminine, and the appeal for most people was just tell me what to do, have the twelve steps, yeah. and I have a kind of guru figure that doesn't know me in real life. And I think the Christian response to both of these phenomenons is not just the theological resources we have for talking about gender, that's important. I think our first response, similar to what Sky said, is the incarnation that teaches us that having embodied close intimate relationships with people and helping them sort out questions of, as a man or as a woman, what is required of me? What is being a good man or woman look like? And more importantly, what is being a good Christian look like? That I think that's our real gift is saying not here's another alternative guru person that tells you 12 steps to live, but who's someone that can point you to Jesus in your real life? Okay. All right. So I, I won't go on my speaking tour quite yet to give my 12 <laughs> steps for true masculinity. I would love to hear that. I would, Deli honestly, I would show for that. <laughs> Delivered with puppets and ukuleles. Okay, thanks all for listening. It's been fun. I'm sure you agreed with everything we said. So come to theholypost.com and leave a message about how much you agreed with us and found nothing objectionable in anything Caitlin said. No, Caitlin's stuff was great. All, all the others, every other statement was questionable. Thank you for supporting us on, on uh, Patreon and Holy Post Plus. Go to holypost.com, check out Holy Post Plus, all the new stuff, content that's going up every week. F lots of fun stuff that you can learn, and we will see you all next week. Bye. This episode of the Holy Post is brought to you by the No Small Endeavor podcast, produced by Great Feeling Studios and PRX. We make a podcast, and we hope you enjoy it. But it doesn't need to be the only podcast you enjoy. If you appreciate grappling with big questions like, what does it mean to live a good life? How can we nourish our souls while navigating the hardships of life in a fallen world? On No Small Endeavor, Professor Lee Camp examines these big questions. The stellar guest lineup includes best-selling authors and past Holy Post guests like Kristen Dumay and David French, as well as actors like The West Wing's Martin Sheen and The Office's Rain Wilson, plus psychologists, pastors, philosophers, and theologians. If you need a place to start, we highly recommend the episode with Reverend James Lawson, the man Martin Luther King Jr. called Friend and Mentor. An architect of the Civil Rights Movement, he discusses how to change the world without hating anybody. So go ahead, check out No Small Endeavor on Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks to No Small Endeavor for sponsoring this episode. Today's show is being sponsored by Caldera Lab. The last time I checked, I have skin. In fact, I have a lot of skin. So why do skincare companies act like only women have skin? 
and why are skincare products almost always exclusively designed for them? Like when my skin gets really dry and irritated, especially in the winter, I look around my house for something and everything I find is full of perfumes and daffodils. It's obvious these products were not created for me. But there's finally a company that is designing skincare products for men. Caldera Lab is the leader in men's skincare and their products are fantastic. They have stuff you'd expect like soap and shaving gel, which I've been using every day and love. But they also have a slate of other skincare products like the Clean Slate, a face wash to begin and end your day with, and a moisturizer that hydrates your skin, but, and this is the key, it leaves a matte finish. When you've got a scalp as big as mine, the last thing you want is shiny, oily skin. On a sunny day, I could blind somebody. That's why the matte finish moisturizer is the answer. And Caldera Lab has a skin serum for men with 3.4 million antioxidant units in each drop. What does that mean? I have no idea, but I guess it's supposed to protect your skin from damage. But here's the point. Men, you can wash, shave, and take care of your skin without smelling like a florist shop. And right now, you can get 20% off with our code, HOLYPOST, at calderalab.com. That's 20% off at calderalab.com by using the code HOLYPOST. As we head into another presidential election season, we could think of no one better to have on the show than Justin Gibney. He's no stranger to the Holy Post. Justin Gibney is the president of the AND campaign and a Holy Post pundit. The AND campaign is a Christian movement that rejects the either-or expectation of the two major political parties that say you have to choose either commitment to Jesus and the Bible or civic engagement and social justice. In this conversation, Justin talks with Caitlin Chess about what it means to take strong positions on the issues of our day without giving our allegiance to one side or party. He also talks about the legacy and wisdom of the black church in America, which is the topic of a new documentary series produced by the AND campaign called How I Got Over. It's a powerful look at the orthodoxy in the black church tradition and its impact on social engagement. There are links to the series in the show notes below. Here's Caitlin's conversation with Justin Giveney. Justin, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited because I feel like these kinds of conversations we tend to have like right before an election (laughs) or like people like you, we pull in when it's like, okay, we're in the heat of it. And I love that we're going to get to talk today with with a little bit of distance, not too much distance from 2024, but a little bit of space. So thanks for being with us today. Caitlin, thanks for having me. So let's start out. It's been almost three years since you were last on the podcast to talk about the 2020 election. Um, As you think back over the last three years, what has changed in the world of kind of faith and politics since then? Maybe what have you learned in the aftermath of 2020? In some ways, it feels like that's really close. And in other ways, it feels like so much has changed. So as you as you think back to that time and now, what do you think has changed or what have you learned? That's a really good question. I think one of the big things is just seeing uh, kind of the post-Trump Republican Party. I guess you somewhat call it post-Trump, sure. <laughs> not completely, right? Because we see 2024 coming up. But just how they would respond, how how much of a handle he would have on, you know, maintain on the party. So that was interesting to see uh, the unfolding of the Biden administration. Um, some, I think they got some, you know, dealing with COVID. Uh, they, they got some, you know, the CHIPS Act and things like that done. But I would say, you know, in some instances, I think the left, when it comes to the culture war stuff, really grabbed a hold Mm. of the administration in ways that I think they could have avoided. And then you have Dobbs, right, which I think played a major role in what's going on right now uh, since uh, 2020. Um, I I do think a lot of pro-life folks got caught flat footed in that they saw a victory in the courts, but realized that, you know, you didn't have the culture or necessarily the states. I think they took some some big hits. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about, I, I just went back earlier this week and listened to the interview that you did with Sky, and he asked you at some point something like, do you think we're moving in a better direction in terms of, of the way the AND campaign is kind of framed of like, it's not just a choice between justice and moral order or conviction and compassion, it's AND. And I think he asked you something like, do you think we'll do that? <laughs> like, is that a possibility? Um, as you think back about the past three years, like, are there places that you see that happening? Does it feel, I feel like we tend to be pretty pessimistic in this conversation. Are there places where you see that happening or 
or is it as pessimistic as we tend to think? I, I see some movement on the ground. Uh, I see people who feel somewhat politically homeless stepping up and saying it and saying, look, I, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with either side. I'm going to kind of raise some of those challenges. So I do see that on the ground when I go to Christian colleges and universities or when I'm just at churches or conferences talking to people. I think there is folks who've been a little more emboldened. But on a larger level, you still have the base of, of both parties who are who are you know pulling further and further to the extremes. And so I don't see the change, unfortunately, when it comes to positions of leadership, uh, whether that is elected officials, movement leadership and so on. Uh, you also have to you know, the, the donor class has a has a role in that. So unfortunately, uh, at the top, I don't see it. But I do see some movement on the ground that's been uh, encouraging to me. Yeah. With that in mind, um, as I said earlier, I. It's important to me because I do, you know, a lot of talking to churches and, you know, Christian colleges about this kind of stuff, too. And I I get frustrated sometimes when, you know, all the requests to do that stuff is like right before an election <laughs> or, you know, it's like, come on and fix this thing at my church, like right before things get really bad. Um, and I appreciate that. I think this is a conversation we need to not only be just ongoing having, but also I think people are looking at 2024 and thinking, okay, the last two presidential elections have been rough in a way that is may, might not be too different from other elections, but in some ways were really difficult. Um, and my hope would be that people are starting to think already about not just how do I take in the political information that's available to me, not just how do I make a good decision when I'm in a voting booth, but also how do I prepare myself, my community? Like, are there things that you think people should be thinking about now, not just in terms of the kind of practical on the ground stuff, though that would be really great too, but like what what might we be doing to think about doing this well in, in the coming year? That's a really good question. And, and one thing I, I always say is keep it in perspective. Uh, the 2024 election is not everything when it comes to politics, and it certainly isn't everything when it comes to our public witness. So I think we need to think of our public witness more holistically to say, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on locally that we can have a, a bigger impact in that's closer to us, that will impact our neighbors that are in closer proximity. Uh, we need to pay attention to that stuff, even as 2024 is, is going on. Uh, and then the other thing is and one thing we've been talking a lot about is um, media hygiene mm. and just what information we're taking in. Are we just looking at headlines and running with it? Do we have a list of uh, progressive thinkers who are intellectually honest that we read, not because we necessarily agree with them, or uh, conservative you know, uh, folks who we read, not because we necessarily agree with them, but because we think they're intellectually honest and we want to hear the best arguments on the other side? If, if we do that, I think we come into the conversation obviously more better informed, but with a different posture. Um, you know, Too often, and you know this, we, we get the characters and worst representations on the other side. And so as we go into this, the other thing that I would I would say also is just remembering that people are more than their vote. Mm -hmm. And so I may think, Caitlin, that you made the worst vote ever, but you are more than that decision. Yeah. And we've got to see that, especially in our brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. I love what you first said there about kind of perspective. I have been frustrated in recent years with people who, you know, have all the best intentions in terms of have suddenly realized, okay, I want my faith to play some role in my political life. I want to be engaged. Um, but often the model that's given to them of engagement is like, I watch the Speaker of the House vote on C-SPAN and obsess over what's happening at like a big national level. And I read a lot and I listen to a lot of podcasts. And and one, I think it kind of, they, they, as you've just described, they might not be taking in media very thoughtfully, but their idea of engagement is really shaped by national politics. Um, when people, if people are hearing what you just said and thinking, oh, you're right, like there's stuff happening in my community, what would you say are good beginning steps for being involved in that, for learning about that, for building relationships? Because I think people have a model for, I watch a bunch of C-SPAN or I you know, pay attention to these big national issues, but they might not necessarily have a model for, okay, there are local issues that, that both are really important to my community and that my Christian faith says something about and I should be involved in, I just don't know how to do it. Yeah, a good place to start to get involved locally, I think, is just reading your local newspaper, reading the local section and seeing what's going on. Uh, most of these places, even in, in small towns, you know, uh, the city council, town council is going to be 
showing you can watch it. You can either go and watch it or many times you can watch it online. And so I think your time would be much better spent watching that online than watching uh, the antics that we often see on, on, on C-SPAN. Uh, those are ways that we can get involved. And what people have to realize is, you know, sometimes it's as simple as one thing that I've told people to do just to understand politics. And it for those who are really interested and really want to get into it is re- kind of reading over the city charter. You don't have to do it all in one day. But if you sit down and say, oh, this is what procurement is. This is how this works. Most people don't really know. And so you want to be involved, but you don't really know. And then, again, familiarizing yourself with uh, your representative, your local representatives. There's a lot of people who are concerned about criminal justice, and I believe it's earnest. But if you ask them who the uh, city prosecutor is, yeah. they wouldn't be able to tell you. Uh, you should be you should know that if, if, if you're really serious about what you're doing. So those, those are a few places to start. That's really helpful. Um, I think you're right. I think part of it, too, is is moving from I'm like intellectually interested in this issue or feel strongly about it to like, do I do I have the motivation to be practically involved? Um, you know, when I was also thinking this morning about, OK, the last few years and the conversation that Christians have had about political life. I feel like there's been a big conversation about kind of a third way or um, so somewhat similar to the Anne campaign's description of like, it's not one or the other of these things, it's both. But I think there's also been a lot of just general criticism among Christians of kind of the, the two party system determining our positions or our politics really shaping our theology rather than vice versa. Um, and then, so there's all these different criticisms of that kind of way of thinking, but then I think there's been a criticism of the third way or of the kind of other approach, either that says it's sort of squishy middle, you're not really taking a position on anything. I don't think that's the best criticism. I think one of the better criticisms is don't pretend you're neutral. Like, don't pretend that, like, you're apart from the way that the parties shape us or the way that political media shapes us. You do have a perspective. You are coming from somewhere. Um, how do you think about that? Because I I really think it's important for us to say, you don't just slot yourself into a party and then let that determine everything. But I think there's some good criticism sometimes of this other kind of approach that says, well, Jesus took sides on some stuff or like you have to make yeah. some decisions at the end of the day um, and you're not a neutral participant. You have been shaped by your political persuasion, by your party. How do we hold those kind of things together to say it's not just neutrality or mushy middle, but also yeah. your other options are not just now I have kind of unquestioning loyalty to a party and I, I just let it, if it's going to shape me inevitably, I just let it happen. Yeah, I think there's some valuable criticisms of the kind of the middle and always kind of carving out this space to criticize both as if they are, uh, you know, uh, equivalent, yeah. kind of making a false equivalence. I would say this. I would say, number one, we cannot be neutral. Yeah. The, the Bible is not neutral. Jesus was not neutral. But we should be impartial. And I think that's a very mm-hmm. big difference. Yeah. So when we critique, we're not looking to say that they're necessarily the same. But we are looking to say, is my critique fair on both sides? Right. Uh, the other thing I would say is I don't think Jesus really took sides. I think he took positions. Mm. And one of the people, you know, sometimes people accuse us of because we don't go with the left or the right of not, you know, of you got to take a side. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think you have to take the right position mm-hmm. because in so many instances, the two sides, there can be, you know, the two sides can take their positions and sometimes both of them are wrong. And I didn't see Jesus say, you know what, these uh, Pharisees are so bad. Let me be a Sadducee. He didn't yeah. do that. He, he had a critique of both of them and where he stood was clear. And so one thing I tell people when it comes to the end campaign, if you name certain issues that we talk about, we take a we take a position. That doesn't mean we necessarily take a side when we see sometimes we're given two wrong answers and that needs to change. So I, I think that's one way to think about it. But what we're trying to do is kind of break this culture war dichotomy. So we're trying to say the idea that everything has to be conservative versus progressive and you got to choose one of those two is not how it should work because I think in in different ways that can both pull us they can both pull us into unfaithfulness. Choose a position, be clear on your position, but you can think through it for yourself. You don't have to use their frameworks and assume that one of them has to be right. Now, we do know that at times you have to vote and you you know, you have to be prayerful and think through what is the what you know, what is the best side to vote for. But I don't think that means that you always have to vote for one side either. So that that's my yeah. that's my take on it. Making sure we take a position, uh, not necessarily a side. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And even what you said at the beginning, I do think 
another one of the criticisms that gets kind of grouped in this category is the you're both sidesing. Like if you criticize both sides, you're both sidesing. And I struggle with this because on one hand, you don't want to do, as you said, kind of false equivalences. Like there must be a parallel on the other side. If this side is bad, then it must be similarly bad on the other side. And yet, like this happens a lot on this podcast, like there are things to criticize in quote unquote both sides. And so how do you think about how do you think about where you kind of put your weight critically? Because I think a lot of people listening here grew up in white evangelical context, grew up in an environment where it was assumed that to be a Christian was to be a Republican. And so we've had this reckoning over the last few years and we've thought, okay, I want to start internally. I want to criticize the party I come from. I want to criticize the community I come from first. But now a lot of those people are sort of renegotiating where they live theologically or politically. Maybe they've changed into a different party. Maybe they're in a different denomination. Maybe they've left the faith or they at least feel kind of, you know, conflicted about their relationship to Christianity. Mm. And I just wonder what you would say to people as they've sort of changed. Does the same thing apply? Should the criticism become internal to a different place? Is there still a healthy way to say, no, we should criticize kind of both parties or both sides? Um yeah, how, how do you think we should navigate that kind of question of where our greatest criticism should be focused? No, that's good. And it differs. It may differ from issue to issue. Sure. But again, I really think it's about impartiality. Uh, a lot of the sometimes the pushback and people saying, well, you're, you're both you're doing both sides. I mean, that happens sometimes. But the, the truth is uh, ideological tribes never want you to critique them. And so what they'll say, if you critique us, if they're so bad over there, how dare you critique yeah. us? And I don't see Christians being able to get away from critiquing both. But we need to be impartial and thorough enough to say, but there is a difference, right? Like this group on this particular issue gets this worse and that matters. And we can be able to say that. I think we can speak with that kind of nuance. We can't we shouldn't be forced into say, yeah, they're really bad. So let me shut up and not say anything about the other side. One, one way that I've put it is, you know, if I have an infection in my left leg and it's just not as bad as the one in my right leg, I still need to do some, something about both of them because they can both kill me. So the idea that one side is so bad that the other can't be critiqued, I don't think that's a faithful perspective. And it does mean we need to be nuanced um, and be specific in how we explain the differences and not just look for an equivalent on the other side. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think also one of the things I hear a lot from people is you know, don't criticize either this person. I hear this a lot when it comes to Biden. Like, oh, don't criticize the Democratic Party or don't criticize Biden because it's we're in an existential moment. Like, do you see how bad stuff is on the other side? Yeah, sure, this might be worthy of criticism, but like, don't, <laughs> we can't lose any ground. Like, we can't mess up what is at least the better option. Um, what do you think? I mean, I can think of some good reasons why Christians especially shouldn't be saying things like that. But how would you articulate yeah. maybe maybe that there is some truth to that? But like, how do we think about that as a strategic question? Because I think some people would say, sure, there's things worth yeah. criticizing. But in the moment we're in, like things are too bad. You can't you can't risk causing any criticism on this side to mean that there's a win over here. Yeah. In my opinion, no one is above critique. No party, no person is above critique. Again, we can be nuanced in that critique. We can add some perspective uh, to what that means when we're, you know, uh, considering the other side as well. But nobody's ab above critique. And we have to be very careful about uh, treating it that way. But I also say this. The fact that we fail to critique the people who we think are better is exactly what we hate about the other side. Mm. People who don't understand Christians that voted for Trump are so mad that they don't critique him, that they just defend him. And I think they're right. But if you want them to critique and you want them to make sure that they're not just defending, you have to do the same thing. And we're both caught up in the same cycle. Uh, we can say one's more wrong than the other. That's fine. But if you want others to critique their side, you need to do the same. And sometimes you doing that can defuse a conversation and get people to actually think a little bit. And then you have to trust the elect. You have to trust that telling the truth is right. And if I'm only giving half of the truth because I think other people can't handle it or they'll swing it, then number one, I don't have faith in my fellow citizens. And number two, I'm not faithful. 
Christians have to tell the truth. We can't tell half the truth because we hope for this election it's going to end up better. Telling half truths has got us into this situation. We need to tell the whole truth, whether we think it's in our immediate self-interest or not. Yeah. Oh, that's so helpful. Um, along similar lines, you know, I um, I also spent a lot of time in 2020 talking about, you know, a book I had written to churches about addressing politics. And a question I got asked a lot in 2020 was about young evangelicals, especially white evangelicals. I kept getting asked, am I worried that young white evangelicals will just replicate the relationship that their parents had or their grandparents had with the Republican Party with the Democratic Party? And at the time, I was feeling like, a lot of other young people where it was just like, no, like we're horrified by what's happening. We're just trying to be, you know, honest about what scripture says. We're trying to be faithful. And three years later, I'm like, I think I was wrong about that. (laughs) Like, I don't think, I think that was a good concern for people to ask about. I don't know that it's been true so much in terms of the Democratic Party particularly, but in terms of sort of picking a new political community to determine what your theology is, what your political positions are, I do start to worry about that. I've seen friends and peers of mine change their political and theological positions on a host of things very rapidly. And I don't want to be uncharitable, but it seems like it's just sort of lining up exactly with what the new kind of community that they're in believes. Um, How how should we, do you see that first of all? And also, how can we know? Like, how do we see ourselves going down that track? Because in charity and sympathy to them, I think they probably are, I mean, a lot of it is legitimate change of opinion, but I think a lot of it is people trying to find out who feels like they're doing the right thing, who is really seeking justice, and a community will shape and form you, and that's not always a bad thing, it's also kind of inevitable, but how could we maybe see when we're beginning to have that kind of relationship, whether it's with a political party or with some other kind of community, before before we can't see it because we're so far into it? I, so to answer your first question, absolutely, I see it. And it, it, it keeps me up at night sometimes because I see it so much. I've had the background to be around both sides of the spectrum and to see the issues on both sides. A lot of people, what happens is we get so familiar, let's say, with the white evangelical issues that we have no idea of the myriad of issues that also come with secular progressivism. Yeah. Right. And so we're running away from something, whether it's church hurt or whatever. We're saying this is bad. This hurt me. This fooled me. And I was wrong because of this. And we run into the arms all the way to the other side and the arms of something that we're not familiar with that may have just as many issues as what we came from. And I think what keeps us from that is, number one, folks like us trying to create community for Christians to say you don't have to be on one side of this ideological battle read history if you read history whether it's conservative or progressive whatever you will see terrible things that have happened and terrible tragedies that have come from people who blindly follow one or the other we have to be able to read that history we have to be able to articulate it and then be discerning enough to say just because i see the issues here that doesn't mean i run to the other one i think nobody put it better than c.s lewis he said that that god uh, sends errors and pairs And he uses our hate of one error, our problem with one error, to send us into the opposite error. So what we end up doing is not correcting what we came from, but committing the opposite error. And I see that so much. And it's heartbreaking because it is tough. And I understand why people do it. But it's still not a faithful way to go about it. Yeah. Oh, that's really helpful. Um, Speaking of history, let's talk a little bit about um, what the Anne campaign is doing in terms of talking about the black church and having a distinctly black church focused perspective on this. Um, I mean, if, if you want to talk about that in general, I would love that just kind of how that focus came about is, has that been a shift yeah. in terms of the end campaigns focus? Um, and, and maybe just kind of generally why that's important or what kind of distinct gift you think that focus offers American politics in general? Yeah, it's, it's definitely become more of an emphasis, you know, so me and my family, I come from uh, the traditional black church. Uh, a lot of folks in the end campaign, not everybody uh, do. And for me, I just began to see how in the black church, which is imperfect for sure. But if you look at the social action, you see an answer to some of the stuff that's going on with the culture mm-hmm. war. You see a group of people who never really fit into the progressive or conservative mold if you look closely and 
I think if we if we study and examine what 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 the black church has been able to do, we see some solutions to some of the things that we're going through. Uh, truly being able to love your enemy and not return hate for hate. That is hard. I mean, we know today that is hard to do. But this is a group of people because of their belief in the authority of scripture that were able to do that. And so what the Ann campaign has been trying to do is, is say there's another tradition here. And I think this helps a lot of people even who are coming out of evangelical traditions and seeing the flaws there. And it says, no, no, you don't have to run away from the authority of scripture. There's other groups who were holding on to the authority of scripture that did it better. And in fact, where white evangelicals may have done really wrong, it wasn't because they were being too biblical. It's because they weren't being biblical enough. Let me show you another tradition that actually did this in a more biblical way because they truly believed what the Bible said. And so when we talk about, you know, even our docuseries, there is a a vicious lie out there that somehow orthodoxy is white or, mm -hmm. you know, believing in the authority of scripture is whiteness. Completely ahistorical. I mean, we can go to the early church fathers in Africa who were fighting for orthodoxy. It, it's, 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 it's completely false. And so we wanted to push back against that idea and say, no, when you look at Frederick Douglass, when you look at uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Bishop uh, uh, G.E. Patterson, I mean, there's so many folks who were strongly believed in the Bible as African-Americans and engaged in, you know, uh, social justice. Uh, so we, we wanted to clarify that because I think it is. Dis there's a deception going on in that regard and I think people need to hear the, t the truth about it yeah I it's interesting I when I first um, I live in Durham North Carolina I moved here a couple of years ago and first got kind of interested in some of the community organizing history here and it's so interesting to me because there is I mean both a really robust black community here that like a lot of communities was like intentionally highway built through it and really kind of um, harmed by that. But there's this really rich history of political advocacy here rooted in black churches. And it's interesting because you've got that history and then you've got a big white elite institution, not entirely white, but like historically quite white institution. And you get a lot of more progressive white college students that will come in and they're really excited about community organizing. And then the first event that they're asked to go to is at a black church. And a lot of their progressive instincts about the separation of church and state, about like, you know, pluralism are really pushed up against by the fact that they're asked to show up to this event at a black church. And so I'm curious too about that element. I, I love how you just described kind of the way that this pushes against our instinct that you have to kind of choose between orthodoxy or social justice. But I also think it pushes up against a more like progressive tendency or even people who aren't progressive but have started to kind of think more about questions about pluralism. It pushes against our instinct that maybe the Christian faith should be this private thing. And if it goes out in public, it's too dangerous. There's too much messy history. And yet the history that I've really learned to love and appreciate in my own city here is like a very public faith. But it's not the public faith that a lot of people are really concerned about in just the last few generations of white evangelicalism. So can you talk a little bit about that aspect of it, about the way that the black church historically has thought about a public presence? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and what you bring up as far as the kind of the left being uncomfortable in those spaces, that's been going on for since the civil rights movement. I mean, if you read about Fannie Lou Hamer, there were folks who were freedom writers who came up from, you know, up north that were like, do we really have to sing these songs? I mean, she's like, no, this is, these two things are inseparable for us, right? The, the black church basically said, it looks at the Exodus motif. It looks at how God uses Moses to deliver the Hebrews and said, we have a God of liberation. We have a God that cares about our subjugation, about our oppression. And that faith was the motivator. So there was no sep there was no way of separating that from who they were and what they were doing. It was their motivation. In fact, Fannie Lou Hamer says someone says, well, most of your life, nothing has happened like you, you haven't been able to get what you want. And she said, you said, so why do you keep doing this? What are you doing? And she said, I do it because I have to. I don't have a choice. This is what God called me to do. And so I think that understanding that those two things are together, it doesn't. It doesn't overcome or get rid of supplant uh, personal transformation or anything like yeah. that. 
but it is very much a part of who God wants us to be because we know God uses us to do his work. And we see in the Bible that in so many cases, that's the work that he was doing, which was freeing the oppressed and, 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 and taking care of the poor and so on. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit specifically about the docuseries, um, How I Got Over, that looks at historic black denominations, black Christian leaders. Um, how, how would you kind of describe the heart behind that or the desire in terms of focusing specifically on these on these leaders, these denominations, um, rather than kind of saying, we have a bunch of ideas. <laughs> like this is a really great thing yeah. that like we conceptually have. What was the desire yeah. to kind of get into some of the history and some of the specific um, examples of black churches in American history? Yeah, I think the need for it came from the fact that usually when you're talking about the black church uh, from a historical perspective, a lot of times that's coming from academia. Mm. And I think academics, even in the black community, are quite a bit to the left of where the actual community is, right? They're, it's very different than where the pew is. And so we were getting these um, explanations or getting, you know, getting these recitations of history that were much further left leaning than you than we thought you would actually see in the black church. Right. It, it, it came with a sort of narrative that fed into the culture war. Yeah. And so we wanted to clear, we wanted to say, hey, let's be intellectually honest. Let's take all the, uh, you know, kind of uh, agendas out of this and say, hey, what was the black church really about? And what were the differences and, and all that? So we really focused on, as I said before, the role that the authority of scripture played in the church. We already talked about the role that it played in social action. We talk, I talk about the role that it played in music, uh, in the establishment of the church. And all those things that give people a greater picture of what it was about that's not kind of secularized. Just like the civil rights movement in general, a lot of people who look up to that movement want to secularize it. They want to take uh, the Christianity out of it, but that you can't. They're, they're, it's inseparable from the hope that the people had, from the courage that they had, and also for, from how, for how they treated their neighbors. Oh. That came come, came directly from the Bible, uh, and so they can't be separated. And we just wanted to say, hey, here's what we you know here's where we think is a real history. So we got guys like Dr. Esau McCauley, uh, Lisa Fields, Charlie Dates, all those folks together, and said, hey, let's let's give an honest depiction from people who are in the church, not folks who are just in ivory tower, for folks who have been in the church, who 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 love the church, and say, hey, we're not. We're not trying to support progressives or or um, conservatives with our narrative. We're trying to get to the truth and show people, you know, where the Bible was, how the Bible was in the center of, of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I, I just spent the last like year and a half doing a ton of research on scripture and American political history. And it's interesting. It was helpful to hear you say that because there were so many books I read about the black church in America that did sort of either implicitly or explicitly sometimes say, this was just helpful language. Like this was a helpful identity. This wasn't really at the heart of it. And and even me as someone who you know does not have that experience has not been a part of the black church, but even just reading some of the folks that I was reading, I was like, you cannot tell me <laughs> that this is just like helpful language. Like it's not even just strategically used. It's like scriptural language is just coming out of people in the speeches they're giving and the letters they're writing in private kind of conversations that they couldn't have known at the time would end up in this history book. And so right. where do you think that desire comes from for a lot of people to kind of minimize that aspect of it? And I partially ask this because, again, I'm thinking of a lot of evangelical folks who feel like the church just doesn't have good examples of, of public yeah. faith. And they, they might want to look to the civil rights movement, to the black church throughout all of American history, but the versions that they're yeah. getting, often by white scholars, is either this was just like a white man's religion that these folks were indoctrinated into, or this was helpful language, because at the time, you know, these simple religious people, just that's how they thought at the time. But they, there does seem to be this desire to paint it as, as you just described, as a secular thing. Why do you think that is? Because I would love to point, and I do often point more people to, hey, read these folks or read some of these books, because I think it will give you some hope. But I, I fear sometimes that when they go down that rabbit hole, they find the scholars that you've described that are like, no, 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 don't take this stuff too seriously. Yeah, it, it, it was such a powerful movement 
that I think both sides always want to Mm co-opt it for their own purposes. So so that's part of it, right? Taking it and saying, hey, how can we use this for us? And the parts we don't like, we can kind of downplay or act like uh, they weren't there. I I do think that's a a large part of what's going on. The other thing is, Caitlin, is it's hard to reconcile with, with culture war thinking. So in culture war thinking, orthodoxy and belief in the scripture are completely opposite of social justice. That's where people on the left are. So they say, well, if I care about orthodoxy, then I can't touch that social justice stuff. Let's talk about colorblindness, yeah. right? And so that you bring that into the conversation. Or if I'm on the left and I care about social justice, wait, you really believe what the Bible said, right? I can't, I can't go along with that, right? So it's, it's tough to reconcile uh, for, and for people to speak through. And then you, you, know, you have the co-optation of almost everything. And so what we're asking people to do it, with the docu series, is to look with new eyes at what was really going on. I had the benefit, and I look back and didn't really realize it at the time, but I had the benefit of having grandparents that were a part of the civil rights movement. So I got to have conversations with my grandfather, who was a civil rights era preacher, and talk about the things that they did and the motivation behind it. And one of the beautiful things that I, I remember about them, and this wasn't everybody, but a lot. The bitterness that sometimes a lot of folks on both sides have today, it, it wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Like we could talk about things that were really tough and you might even shed a tear. But there was a joy, wow. right? There was still a joy to say. God is with us, that we can get through this and, and so on. And so to be to have had those interactions and looking back now and they've you know, they've all passed away. But looking back now to have those interactions was was huge because I don't you don't have to tell me what it was. I talk to the people and still have people in my church today who are part of the civil rights movement. So I get it from, you know, from people who were there. And it's very different than some of the stuff that we kind of uh, we get in, you know, in, in pop culture. Yeah. Oh, that's so that's so great. Um, one last question as we finish, as people are approaching, like I said, another difficult election year that is really kind of already upon us truly um what gives you hope as you think about the next year um maybe in general but also specifically as you think about the political lives we will lead in the next year is there anything that makes you makes you hopeful i think the thing that gives me hope again like what i see on the ground i see christians really speaking up and then i see leaders uh i see leaders who are willing to say what needs to be said whether it's you know michael ware um, whether, you know, whether it's folks, again, like Charlie Dates, yeah. Esau Macaulay, who are standing up in different spaces and saying what needs to be said and not buying into the false dichotomy that we have to separate social justice from moral order, uh, that those two things can't come together. And if you don't choose one of those sides and go along with everything they say, then, then you're somehow wrong. I think if we think about that and take it to its logical conclusion, it's pretty absurd. And what helps me feel better about that is the leaders who who God is raising up to speak into that. Yeah, that's so helpful. Thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate all of the work that you're doing and and thankful for the language and like practicalness of the things you've given us as we approach this next year. So thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Keep writing and uh, keep keep talking. We need you. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.